morning, everybody. So here we are, another Sunday. You've had a whole week to practice, remembering that God is love and that God loves you and that prayer is really to remember to align our mind with that truth rather than feeling like we need to beg God for anything. Everything's already been given. We just need to wake up and become aware. And so last week we had a conversation about prayer and about standing in the gap, being that place of prayer for one another and for ourselves. And you were encouraged to take on prayer this past week. And how many of you took on that practice of prayer this week? Excellent. So I see some hands, and I'm guessing that somewhere someone had an insight, an understanding, some aha that you cannot wait to share with us, right? To, so we can inspire one another to these ideas. And Brian's hand... See that? How quickly that happened. So Brian Nelson will share what your experience was. Brian? So uh, one of my favorite prayers is the prayer for abundance. And it is actually through a, um, uh, a um, oh my God, what do they call it? The, um, whatever, it was a class I was listening to online. <laughs> and it was on healing, and it was about feng shui, and the realization that I don't sell, like when I, see something like other person that isn't my favorite, if, if they win at something, I don't celebrate that. I don't celebrate their abundance. And I'm realizing that in doing so hurts my abundance because they are me. So I, I celebrate somebody's abundance, even if they aren't my favorite person. And that's what I realized this week. Excellent, Brian. That is super. You know, there is forgiveness right? Because so many times when we are in a place of unforgiveness, which was our daily word for the day, we're not really hoping for the best for that other person, are we? Right? So the prayer is, can I wish for you the best? Can I be grateful for your abundance? I love that, Brian. Thank you. Anybody else? I'll give you a chance if anybody else wants to. Oh, I see Marilyn like barely raising her hand. I don't know if I should. All right, Marilyn. You know, I'm timid because, um, you know, I love to talk, but I, I'd love for all of you to talk, too. And, uh, but what was interesting was um, I've, I've been on a committee where I had to um, compare about six banks, and that meant going in and interviewing them and seeing what services they had and what their rates were and things like that. And it has been with a lot of apprehension that I've done this because um, it's a, a committee. I'm not doing it on my own. And uh, so I, I had to pray, I had to call Unity, you know, to even get the thing done. And I, there was so much information, but it, it came together. God answered each prayer. Uh, I managed to write up a presentation that was really nice. And then when I was at the meeting where I had to present it, they were starting to talk about budgeting. And, um, and I started getting really angry. And, uh, and I... I had this brilliant thing where I grabbed my phone where I have a photo of the long version of the serenity prayer and I just started repeating that so that I could calm down and not be the boss of the committee. <laughs> and so it was like, you know, honoring each person and what they had to say. And with that, that was it. <laughs> Super, Marilyn. Thank you for that. So I'm just going to remind us all that we can pray in any moment. We don't have to wait until things get so dire that we think, oh my God, now it's time to pray, right? Like when I find myself in a meeting and my buttons are getting pushed and I become aware of that, what a perfect opportunity to pray. And you can do that within. Nobody even need, need I bet nobody knew you were sitting there in that moment praying. So thank you, Marilyn. Thank you to each one for taking on those practices. So this is our last week of this series. We began this year with the overarching theme that we are wanting to see with perfect vision this year and that what we are going to do is look through a spiritual lens. And so we began this year with this series all about basic unity teachings, basic unity ideas and how we can take on those ideas and begin to see life and our world through a different perspective. And so as we begin this morning, because our conversation today is on the Bible, a new look at, the old, at an old book, I want to remind you all of something, and that is that we hear all the time, or maybe you have or haven't yet, that unity has no dogma. Anybody ever hear that one? Mm -hmm. Unity has yeah. no dogma. All right, so I hear people going, yes, but here's the thing. It doesn't mean that unity doesn't have teachings. 
Unity doesn't have ideas. Unity has teachings and ideas and principles and practices for you to take on and to try. The difference is that you do not have to accept everything that we share here in order to be a part of unity. That's where unity has no dogma. You don't have to believe this way in order to be a part of unity. So what I encouraged you to do a couple of weeks ago, and I'm going to encourage you to do again today, is to set aside for the moment while you're sitting here in Unity Hall, set aside your belief system, your BS, as I called it the other week, because we all have it, right? Set that aside for a moment. Allow yourself to open your mind to a new idea, a fresh understanding, a new perspective, and then when we're done today, if you want to pick up that BS again as you walk out the door, you're free to do so. Uh, but maybe allow one kernel, one idea of what we've been talking about to take root and to contemplate and to think so that you can come to a deeper understanding of these ideas. So, the Bible. Now, this is really interesting because a couple of weeks ago on the Unity Ministers Facebook page, we have our own little private group, Unity, all Unity Ministers, and the question comes up, one of the ministers says, you know, somebody came to me after service today and asked if unity was Bible-based, and I didn't know how to answer that. What would you have said? And you'd think, well, here we are, this unity group of ministers. We should know the answer to that question, right? And so then it was fascinating to hear all of the many responses around that. And are we Bible-based? So here's where some of it comes from, why people reject the idea that unity are Bible, is Bible-based, and that is because people have an idea of what it means to be Bible-based. And many, many um, communities that are spiritual, that are Bible-based, aren't necessarily believing and teaching what we do here at Unity because they're taking the Bible and they're speaking of it, of it from this place in their perspective of being the literal and an errant word of God. Have you all heard that? The literal and an errant word of God. And therefore, if in the Bible it says this, then that must be, and then that's how I'm going to live. So let me give you an example of where that could be a problem, where that could be an issue. So last fall, I read a couple of books, one of them being a book called Unfollow, and it was the Megan Phelps Roper book, and she was raised in the Westboro Baptist Church. How many of you have heard of the Westboro Baptist Church, right? So several people have. So the Westboro Baptist Church took on the idea of the literal, inerrant interpretation of Scripture, and from that decided that if you were identified as an LGBTQ person, that that was wrong and they needed to let you know that was wrong, and so they would start demonstrating. For example, if somebody who um, was gay, who died, let's just say, of AIDS or something, because that's how it kind of began, they would go to where the funeral was taking place and they would go with their picket signs to say, you know, you are wrong and this is wrong and you need to repent and you need to be saved, right? And so there they were, and Megan was like five years old when she began that, right? That was the tradition that she was raised in. And to me, as I stand here and share this, to me that sounds like the least loving thing of all, you know, to go and do that. But I also have to take into consideration that if that's really your understanding, it may be that you think you're doing the most loving thing in the world by going there with those picket signs because I just want to save you from hell. That's it, Lisa. I don't, I don't want you to go to hell, right? So it kind of perverts the teachings in such a way, right, that I think I'm being loving, but in reality what I'm doing is othering. I'm creating separation. I'm creating limitation. And so what happened with Megan was that in conversation, she began to open her mind to a new understanding and realized that what she had learned was an error and that it created separation and it was not based in love. And so she has stepped away from the Westboro Baptist Church. But that is an example to you of how a spiritual community can take a scripture and say this is the truth and hold that truth over your head and from my perspective, from the unity's perspective, being the complete opposite of what we are called to be. The same thing with um, scripture being used to justify lots of behavior. So scripture being used to justify slavery at one point in time in our country. To justify the idea that there are races and that there are some races that are um, better than other races. 
right? So that was the conversation in this country at one point in time. It continues to be the conversation for people who may identify with the KKK or white nationalists who will say that they are a Christian, these are Christian ideas that we are teaching here. But I'm sure each of us here can recognize that that's a perversion of the teachings. And yet there is scripture being used for that. So um, Derek Black, who is a part of that white nationalist movement, the same as Megan, woke up to the understanding that this is the wrong way to see things and began to open his heart, his mind, his spirit to a new way of seeing our oneness, our connection, our equality. There was an example here almost two years ago now where as a country, you know, this new um, way had been, was being established in which we were told that children were going to be taken away from their parents at the border. And the difference was, here was the main point. In order to prevent others from following, if they knew their children were going to get taken away, then they would not try to come in that way. They would not try to enter our country that way. And so a new policy was established for that specific purpose, to take children away, to, to stop others from bringing their children. And at the time, there was a news um, opportunity, right, to say this is why we're doing this. And what was brought up was Romans 13. Romans 13. So what does Romans 13 say? Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. That scripture was shared as our reason why we should simply accept that policy. And the question becomes, what do we do? Does that mean that if we see unjust policies, that we as Christians, that we as Spiritual beings should not speak up about that, right? And then, quite interestingly, the next chapter in Romans is love fulfills the law, right? So I share these with you as some examples of how Scripture can be used and twisted and perverted and is all the time in our culture and in our society to create these divisions and these um, problems that are from my perspective, from Unity's perspective, less than loving, forgetting the spirit of the law, if you will, stuck in the letter of the law. And so for that reason, I wouldn't describe Unity as Bible-based simply because there's an image that comes to your mind if you hear that we are Bible-based, and that is likely not the image of who we are, right? So my answer to that was, Unity is not Bible-based, but Unity does teach the use of Scripture as a tool, just like we teach prayer as a tool, just like we teach meditation as a tool. We teach metaphysical Bible interpretation as a tool. So what does that mean? Okay, so let's first of all talk about how does unity look at the Bible? Well, unity looks at the Bible as being, for one, a history, a history of the Jewish people from the time of creation through the Exodus and all of that to the Promised Land, it is their story, the story of the Jewish people. And then the New Testament is the story of Jesus and what happened with that story of Jesus, who he was and what he came to show and what happened after he was gone. So there's a, a history that's presented in Scripture. And Unity recognizes that history that's presented there. Unity also looks at Scripture as all of our own individual stories. So we begin with Genesis, we begin with our creation, and then we begin with the fall in our consciousness that we are one with the divine, and we begin to identify with simply being sense beings here in this world to experience sense consciousness and forget, fall from the remembering that we are one with the divine, and that all of the stories that take place in that Hebrew scripture is designed for us to remember the truth, to come back into an awareness of the truth through the examples that are given in all of those stories until we reach the end of the Bible, where the New Testament is, where we finally have the Christ. So we go from Adam man, forgetting, uh, separation consciousness, to the Christ, 
remembering we are one. We are here to be the light of the world. God is within us, and it is our story of moving from sense consciousness to Christ consciousness. And so therefore, every single story in the Bible provides with us with an opportunity to take a look at it and ask, what is this to teach me on how I can move from an idea of lack and limitation to a remembering of this oneness, of being that Christ? And that's where metaphysical Bible ter interpretation comes in. So with metaphysical Bible interpretation, uh, what it is is that we are reading a story and every single character in that story is an aspect of ourselves. That's the important piece to remember with metaphysical Bible interpretation because otherwise what you're doing is you're reading a story in Scripture like the story of Mary and Martha, remember, where uh, Martha is working hard and getting everything ready and she's upset because Mary is sitting there with Jesus, right? And in our mind, we might identify with one of those characters, like I might identify with Martha and I might identify my sister with Mary and I might get very upset with my sister and see something outside of me as each of those characters. But instead, what we need to remember is that each of those characters represents a part of myself. So the best way that I can share this with you, an understanding of this, is to actually interpret a scripture metaphysically. And I chose one today that you should all be pretty familiar with. And it's a little bit of a long one, so it's going to take me a moment to read. But this is the story of the lost son. Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, forgive me, my share of, father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided the property between them. Not long after that, the son, younger son got together all that he had and set off for a dis, distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare while I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard the music and the dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf. He has found him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you, never disobeyed your orders, yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you killed the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. The story of the prodigal son. Now quite often that story of the prodigal son is used as an example to show us of when we walk away from Christianity, we walk away from God, and then eventually we come to our senses, we find Jesus, and God is there waiting to welcome him welcome us back. Right? That's typically how I hear the story of the prodigal son interpreted. And there's a lot to that in the metaphysical interpretation, but it goes much deeper. So remember, each person in the story is an element of us. 
So the prodigal son who left is an element of us. The father who is there is an element of us. The servant who is ordered is an element of us. The son who is left behind is an element of us. And what do we have to learn from this story? So any time in a scripture that we see that there is a fa- the father in this case, or that Jesus is there, what do you think that might represent of us? Our higher self, right? It's that Christ consciousness. It's that Father within, that Spirit within, that one that we can never separate from that is within. So in this case, that is true with this story. The Father in this story represents that place within us that where God always is, where our home really is. Now, in any moment, everybody knows this, right? Everybody here know that the Father is within us, the God is within us. Call it what you will. Love is within us. The divine is within us. We are one with divine mind. We all know this, right? We talk about this every week. Now, we go about our day. How many of you stay in that place of awareness throughout your day? <laughs> By the giggles, I'm guessing not, right? I mean, we, we don't stay there. On any given day, we might move in and out of that awareness throughout our day. Throughout our day, we might in the morning begin with prayer and go, yes, I'm centered, I remember this. And an hour later, we're thinking about what is something out there that we need to see or do or experience so that we can again fill up this place inside that feels like something's missing. Anybody recognize that? Yeah. You know, and so we're constantly looking outside of ourselves, constantly looking outside for our peace, for our joy, for our hope, for our contentment. You know, so it can look like this, you know. um, Someday, someday when I'm, uh, when I have my kids, I'm finally going to be fulfilled. And then when we have kids, well, someday when these kids move out, you know, I can (laughs) finally experience my joy, right? Or it might look like, oh, if I only had this job, things would be great and then that job comes and it might fulfill us for a moment but then a year later or a week later we're going oh my gosh I can't stand that job I need something else right or I'll finally be happy not when I get the job but when I finally retire from the job I mean whatever it is for us we're constantly throughout our day moving in and out of an awareness that I am here home one with God to oh my gosh I need this we do this constantly in and out throughout our days. Anybody not do that? Right, we all do that. So that's the son, the prodigal son, who throughout our life, throughout our days, throughout our years, moves in and out of this awareness of the truth. And as that part of us moves out of the awareness of that truth, we often find ourselves eventually in this place of once more longing Longing to know that oneness again. Longing to return to truth again. Recognizing that in this place where I am right now, I'm starving. I'm not fulfilled. What do I need to do? Right? And then this uh, idea will arise in our mind. Well, okay, this is, this is where I need to remember to return to God. I need to remember to turn back to an awareness of God, right? Right? And the, and the important piece about this particular story is that it doesn't take that son to get all the way back to the father to experience the father welcoming him home that as soon as the father, while he's still at a distance, at that point the father's already welcoming him back. It doesn't mean that I've got to show up back home perfect, completely aware, completely transformed. As soon as I have the idea I need to turn back to God, God is right there waiting to greet me and welcome me back. And this happens throughout our days and weeks and years and lifetimes. Prodigal son, back and forth we become. And God is always there waiting to welcome us back. So then along comes this character, the servant, Right? The father tells the servant, bring a robe, bring a ring, bring new shoes. Well, help me to welcome my son back. So what do you think? What's the servant represent in you and I? Generosity? Sharing? sharing, sharing faith? Giving? giving doing the work. Doing the work, 
Now remember, with metaphysical Bible interpretation, there is no wrong answer. <laughs> Wherever each one like is in their place in consciousness, what that represents for them, that's correct. That's what, it is. that's what it is. For me, as I think about that servant, what I think about is that part in me that is willing finally to come back into the idea that I am here to serve that divine consciousness. I'm here to serve. And what does that look like? Well, it looks like bringing the robe, wrapping yourself in that robe. Well, what does that robe represent? So in Unity, we have a couple of tools that we use for metaphysical Bible interpretation, one being a meta something called the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary. It's a big, thick book that Charles Fillmore wrote that tells you the meaning of different things like um, names of people or places, characters in the Bible, what do their characters represent? And then a smaller book called The Revealing Word, which tells us ordinary things, like what does it mean, a robe, a ring, new shoes. And so in unity, this idea of wrapping yourself in the robe means putting on a new state of consciousness. Wrapping yourself in a new state of consciousness. So that part of me that is ready to listen and serve God begins by wrapping myself in this new state of consciousness. And in that new state of consciousness, I'm given a ring. Well, what's the ring represent? In unity, the ring represents, in this story, power, the acceptance of power, and that power being divine love. So I wrap myself in a new state of consciousness, and I remember that I am here to be love. I'm here to be that love. And then the feet, the new shoes. In unity, the feet always represent understanding, divine understanding. And so as I wrap myself in a new consciousness, ready to own my power of love, I come to a new place of understanding. And that new understanding is that right here I am home. I am home in the divine. And I am here to express from my divinity. So we've talked about the prodigal son. We've talked about the father. And we've talked about the servant. What about the character we never hear about? The brother left behind. That one hardly ever gets talked about in this story. So how many of you recognize the idea of, you know, God, I pray every day like I'm supposed to. I meditate every day like I'm supposed to. I do these spiritual practices that Joanne tells us I'm supposed to do. But can you believe that I have not received what I think I should be receiving? Anybody ever have ideas like that? Okay, that is the elder son. The elder son. And what does the father say to that elder son? Those thoughts that we have when we want to compare ourselves to the way that life is being experienced by others and how we're doing everything we should, but it's not looking like it ought to. The father reminds that elder son, you have never left home. When you and I are getting into that place of wanting to argue with God, why, why haven't you answered my prayers? I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. You are in a place of lack and limitation with that very idea. And you simply need to wake up to the remembering again. Where I am, God is. I am home here. And I've always been provided for here. And that is a metaphysical interpretation prodigal son. So I want to share with you a practice that you can take on this week. Oh, I didn't bring up my bulletin. So there it is. What I'm going to suggest for you is that you take a, a simple line from scripture. Don't make it complicated. Take a simple line. I gave you one if you want to work with it. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. And take that idea this week and contemplate it. Think about it. What does that mean to me? How does that speak to me? What does that say to me about living as this Christ's presence and power that I am? If I take that idea in any moment, remember when I leave the awareness that I am one with God, how will this idea help restore my sanity, my peace of mind? It can be this scripture or any scripture of your choosing. But take and work with it. One year I worked with, every day I read 1 Corinthians 13. You know, the love chapter. Every day for a month I read that. And I contemplated it through my day. And I thought, what would it look like to live this in my day? What does it look like to live that in your day? And then, of course, that's the point. How can you apply that and live that in your life on this day? 
So who's willing to take on that practice with me this week? All right, so I'm looking. I'm looking who said yes. Yeah. <laughs> Marilyn's always happy to share, but she'd like to hear from some others of you. So put it into practice this week and come back and share so that we can inspire one another to be the truth that we know, to move beyond the letter of the law to the spirit of love that is behind the law and that is the fulfillment of the law. Thank you. God bless.